This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. I will never forget the first reporting from one worldwide sporting event. This was recently the first day CNN's special investigative reporter looked straight into the camera. This is deadpan without a hint of a smile and apparently without the slightest inkling that he was saying something odd or humorous. He said, and I quote his exact words, there's good news as the games begin, bomb threats are coming in at a slower rate than had been expected, end of quote. When a TV worldwide newsman actually looks into the camera and says the good news is that the bad news isn't as bad as they expected or thought it was going to be, that describes this planet with astonishing accuracy as we look ahead to the millennium lying before us. What is God's plan for this planet? What is God's purpose for your life? Is it just a vast, unforeseen, unpredictable melange of nothingness with no overarching design, no great concept behind it all? Is it just an accidental juxtaposition of time and space? Or is there a great plan behind it all? What is God's plan for your life? How can you get motivated for it? How can you get about it? One time... A boss of a company and his sales manager were looking gloomily at the sales chart for this company there on the wall. And in one corner, there was a graph that showed the company's descending profits. They were losing money. And the rest of the chart contained a map of all their territory with pins stuck in it showing the location of each salesman they had out on the road. Finally, the sales manager sighed and said, I think the only hope is for us to take the pins out of the map and start sticking them in the salesman. You need to get motivated. You need to get going in your life. God has a purpose for your life. It's not a blind, unforeseen accident. God has a will for you, and the greatest moment of your life will be when you find God and find God's plan for your existence. And that is peace like a river and joy like a running stream. God knows you. God knows who you are. A friend of mine from England told me this story that there was an Englishman driving through America for the very first time on an automobile trip, and he looked, and there was a highway sign which had on it these words, Drive slowly. This means you. And the man from England thought to himself, By Jove, how did they know I was here? God really does know that you're here. God knows everything you're going through in your life, everything you've gone through in your past, everything you face in your future. And God has an eternal future for you. God loves you as a father, loves a child, as a mother, loves a baby. God loves you with a love which my words cannot describe and your mind cannot understand. Therefore, neither one of us have anything but the most faint and fleeting glimpse of what this love of God is like. But God knows you're there. God knows everything going on in your life this moment. God knows every freckle on the back of your neck, every hair on your head. God knows your decisions, your indecisions, your vexations, that which angers you, that which intimidates or terrifies you, and God has for you the power to live your life in joy if you'll live your life in love. Again, the two great commandments of Jesus of Nazareth were these, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The love of God and the love of others, that will transform your life beginning, if you'll have it so, beginning right here and now, this moment as you're listening to this broadcast. The odds of this universe happening by accident, in fact, just the odds of your eye itself, with its ability to perceive light, to focus, to have both peripheral and foveal vision, just the odds of your eye happening by accident are equivalent to the odds of an unabridged dictionary resulting from an explosion in a printing shop. You are here for a plan and a purpose. God has a will for your life, and the greatest prayer quoted around the planet by this Jesus of Nazareth. He said to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That is a prayer by the mortal, by you or by me, that the will of God will prevail in our lives and upon this earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're asking for God's will and wisdom to prevail in our lives. And when you align and synchronize your life with the will of God, big things, important things, significant things, joyous things will begin to happen. You need three things in this life, something to love, something to do, 
and something to look forward to. Love God and people. Seek to do the will of God in a life of serving humanity and look forward to the boundless future with faith and hope and love. There is no end to the progress lying before you. You're only just beginning. You've only just begun. Don't give up the fight. Don't give up the joy. Don't give up the love. Don't give up the hope and the faith and the commitment to the highest and the best things, truth and beauty and goodness. Don't give it up. Keep that hope alive in your heart and in your soul. God has a will for your life. No matter how far down you've gone, God can bring you up. God can make a way where there seems no way. God can bring a path where there seems no path. God can make a way through the trackless jungles and swamps of your life, of your philosophy, of the time in which you live, and can bring you out with spiritual victory. You are a son or daughter of God. You are kin to the Creator. You are here by divine design. It's not a blind, vast, unforeseen accident. God cares about you. God loves you with a love which will not let you go. And God has a will for you which will not let you go either if you will only cling to it. God wants great good, the greatest possible good for your life. But unless you want that great goodness too, unless you yourself personally choose and desire the will of God in your life, God will be powerless to bring it into your life because God respects your free will. You're a free moral agent. You can make up your mind what you're going to do with your time and your energy on this earth. And that's what life consists of, those two factors, time and energy. You're given a certain amount of time, a certain amount of physical energy or health with which to accomplish your purpose. What is your purpose in life? Have you found the will of God, the great plan for your existence, God's will, God's purpose, God's reason for bringing you into existence. Without God, all your solutions are going to be worse than your problems themselves, because without God, your solutions will just be power, wealth, fame, drugs, alcohol, sex, this sort of material thing. These only make the pain of an unspiritual life all the worse. It will only make you all the more miserable. Rather, give your life to God and live by the power of the Spirit, by spiritual things, by love and forgiveness, truth and beauty and goodness, and love for God and love for others. Those are the two great commandments. Just on your own, by your own power, by your own grit and determination, you cannot conquer the great issues of your life and the great temptations of your life. You need spiritual power from beyond and from within, the power of God, and faith releases that power of God. Admit defeat then give it up and turn to God for true victory and live in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit in man, it is written, is the lamp of the Lord or the candle of God searching all the inmost parts. You say, well, that doesn't sound like much of a philosophy. You're saying give up on your problems. I'm saying give up your problems to God because you as a human being, flesh and blood and bone on this planet, are simply not wise enough and strong enough to figure out this universe, you're not wise enough and strong enough to figure out how a housefly came into existence, really. I mean, could you make a housefly? Could you make a worm of the earth? Go dig up a worm with a spade sometime and stretch it out and look at it. Have it wiggle around on your kitchen table and study it. And ask yourself, why is it that after centuries of humanity studying histology, zoology, entomology, the science of everything that creeps and crawls upon the earth and flies above it, that science has yet to be able to create, I mean create from nothing, from nothingness or from inert dead matter, even a worm or a housefly, or even some one-celled protozoan you can only see or an amoeba-like creature with pseudopods you can see under a microscope. Why is it science hasn't been able to create those from nothing? Because the secret of life is held by God. Is the theory of biogenesis. Life comes only from life. All science teaches that truth. What was the original life? Who was the original life giver? The living God, who is your father and your friend, who can give you spiritual life for living your spiritual life with joy, with peace, power, and purpose as the son or daughter of God you really are and you were born and created to be. Jesus of Nazareth did not teach the sort of weak, powerless, decaffeinated Christianity which is portrayed in so many books and so many sermons today. Jesus taught living in a relationship with the living God. Somebody asked me, 
what I think the best thing on TV is. I said the best thing on TV is the knob, the off switch. Reach over, turn it off from time to time. Get to know God. Get to know people. You can know God not just as something somebody talks about or somebody somebody talks about on radio or television. You can know God as your father and your friend, and you can discover people. You can love people right where they are and as they are, not idealized images through the media, but the way people really are, the way God loves people, the way God loves you. This is one of my primary concerns about the personal computers, the internets. We have them here at the Horseshoe Ranch. We use them, yet they can be so isolating. If you spend all day at the office staring at a computer screen, all night at home staring at a television screen, there is a chance you may become an ingrown, introverted, isolated person. Get out and help people. Get to know people. Do things for people. Love and serve. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. The love of God and the love of people, as I have reiterated, are the two great commandments. But your debts to divinity are payable to humanity. Your love of God is thus expressed in your loving and caring for people. I mean people in your own family, your own children, your own family and friends and relationships, the other people in the community, your next door neighbor. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Do something for your neighbors. Care about people, love them, and live in joy. You cannot live in endless despair no matter what happens. You have to get on with your life. Just one week after the humorist Bill Cosby lost his son Ennis to a freeway murderer, Bill Cosby was back at work on his weekly comedy television program. And when journalists asked him why, Cosby replied, and I quote, We have to laugh. We've got to laugh. During the depths of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln read joke books to his cabinet ministers. And he once said, if I did not laugh, I would die. Some people think he said, if I didn't laugh, I would cry. He said, if I didn't laugh... I would die. This is Abraham Lincoln speaking. Even in the face of tragedy, God gives the gift of humor. The Navajo Indians believe that God's first gift to humankind was the gift of laughter. Learn how to laugh. It will help to heal your hurting heart. There is joy in life for those who live with faith in God. There is the laughter of the spirit, the gladness of heart, which comes in loving God and loving others and giving your past, present, and future to God, and live fearless of life and fearless of death as the son or daughter of God, the brother or sister to humanity. You were born and created to be. And write for free literature on the spiritual life to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written things on prayer, meditation, worship, finding God, life after death. All this literature, yours free, write to Box 3080, Oakhurst, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644. USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.